Hey everyone, um, my name is Coleman Hagar and I am presenting um, our week two assignment. Um, it's supposed to go through, um, kind of outline Paul's life, um, the world he lived in, um, his early kind of childhood and early life, and then um, his occupation as a tent maker. Um, so I created this uh, presentation to go through those things. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, here we are. Uh, okay, Paul's early life. Paul was born uh, around 6 AD to Jewish parents in Tarsus. Um, this was kind of, it was interesting to kind of read up about Tarsus and where it was. And I have a map here um, kind of illustrating where it is at the very top next to Turkey. Um, but Tarsus was, kinda, was quite removed um, from everything in Jerusalem and, uh, and, um, Nazareth, and it was kind of it was pretty far away from everything. So it's interesting um, that Paul was born here, um, and it just I think it just shows that Paul definitely covered a lot of area when he was doing his work. Um, he was able to go a lot of places. So um, he was born to uh, he was both a Roman citizen and a citizen of Tarsus. Um, so he had dual citizenship, which is an interesting fact, um, and it's something that uh, really kind of helps him in his future. Um, as a missionary and traveling to all these different places, he was um, he was able to get into different places and kind of travel and see different things. Um, and uh, I have a little bit of um, kind of down towards the end um, some information about um, why he was a dual citizen um, and what what happened there. Um, but it, because it doesn't happen, it didn't happen to everybody back then. Um, not everybody was granted this dual citizenship in two different places, but uh, Paul was lucky enough to get that, um, and, it, and it definitely helped him in the long run. Um, and he was educated. Uh, ed he was either educated in, I'm going to butcher this, but Jamale or in, or in Tarsus. Um, but nevertheless, he was educated. And again, it was just another kind of, it, it seems like Paul was uh, born into kind of a very, I don't want to say privileged, um, but better off, uh, better off class. Um, he, like I said, he had that dual citizen, dual citizenship, and he was, he was able to be educated, which again was another rare thing uh, back in these times. So, and again, it's these two different things that kind of help him um, become uh, the person he does become, the, the missionary he becomes. So, um, it's cool. To, it was interesting to read about um, his early life and like have the knowledge of what he did um, and what he did for the New Testament and the New Testament. Um, and see kind of how uh, these things that happened in his early life kind of reflect in his later work. Um, moving forward with Paul's life, um, he seemed to follow the footsteps of his father, who was also a Pharisee. Um, Paul began uh, his work as a Pharisee, um, and it says that his father was uh, too, and that just uh, shows us that Paul was born into a, a Jewish family who was who was a uh, very law abiding. They followed the rules. Everything was. Um, they took it very seriously um, because his father being a Pharisee. So I imagine Paul growing up, seeing his father doing um, his work, um, and Paul looking at that and saying, "Yeah, that's what I want to do as well." Um, his goal was to uh, stop the spread of Christian beliefs in Jerusalem, um, and he was um, very, very passionate about this goal. Um, as we know, we, we, we read uh, some of Paul's letters and his teachings, and, and we see the passion that he uh, brings to the table about his teachings. Um, so he had that same passion to stop um, stop Christian beliefs uh, when he um, was referred to as Saul. But as a, as a Pharisee, he was very determined, um, and he even received written permissions uh, permission from the temple and the high priest to execute his goal. So he was almost this like very elite kind of Pharisee who was uh, called on to do this do this job and to stop um, the spread of these beliefs. So he was uh, definitely good at what he did um, in both being a Pharisee and a missionary. Um, moving on one more, uh, his early life uh, continuing um, after his kind of Pharisee, him being a Pharisee, uh, we all know this story around 34 AD, Paul experiences an encounter on the road to Damascus. Um, this is such a very pivotal turning point for Paul and also I think just for um, the church as a whole. Um, 
he experienced he has this experience on the road to Damascus where he experiences the Holy Spirit, um, and it's described as like this flat, bright flat or flash came down from the sky and um, healed Paul of his, of his blindness. Um, and it's I have a picture here. It's very dramatized, I think, but it kind of gives us a, an an idea of what it would look like. Um, we see this light coming down, um, the light being the Holy Spirit, and Paul is witnessing this. And this was kind of Paul's turning point. This was the the three sixty that Paul had to do. He went from being this very um, determined Pharisee to a person who was very determined to spread Christianity. Um, he he used that same passion he has as a Pharisee to stop Christianity and, and kind of flipped that, translated that into spreading these Christian views that he now, um, he now believed in and, and so on. And it's a, it's a very cool kind of transition. Um, and I love, I love this story because, uh, working with youth, it's very much of, Oh, I'm too far gone or I've done this or I've done that. Um, like God doesn't want to save me anymore. Yada, yada, yada. Um, but then we look at Paul, who's this Pharisee who was literally killing Christians, um, persecuting Christians, um, has this moment, this just one day randomly, that the Holy Spirit comes down and says, "This is what you're going to be doing now." And he is he's he then turns out to be one of the best missionaries um, that we see. Um, so it's a it's quite a cool story, um, very very pivotal for uh, the church. Um, and yeah. Um, so a little bit more after his conversion, uh, he would go on to write 14 books in the New Testament. We all know those books. We're all studying them, which I'm excited for because I'm learning a lot already and it's only the second week, but um, it's been awesome. Um, he was able to train uh, other missionaries, um, John and Timothy. Um, so that means he wasn't just doing this work. Um, he was doing this work, but he was also... Um, preparing the next generation to do this work and, and continuing to, to build those missionaries. Um, and, and we get to read about that a little bit in, in his uh, life as a tent maker. We get to kind of explore that idea of his. Um, and then we also see that because of his work, he experiences around five years in prison. Um, and it's crazy to think that he was so, and it, it just shows his passion. He was so dedicated to what he was doing that he was like, okay, I'll go, I'll go to prison for five years and to keep doing this. And it kind of shows that, again, that 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 switch of passion, that's that um, drive he had to want to, wanting to do this. Um, he was very motivated. He wasn't going to let anything stop him. Um, and we see that we see that in a lot of his stories, and we see him experiencing um, very unruly punishment in prison and and these like awful conditions and we know that he's he's experiencing that so he can spread the word of god which is truly inspiring um kind of looking at the world that paul lived in um he um again born in tarsus um tarsus was the capital over a roman providence of silica um this is how paul was able to gain uh dual citizen dual citizenship um Tarsus being uh, a capital in Roman providence, um, he was both a citizen of Tarsus and now of Rome. Um, so again, this kind of helped him uh, in his future work because he was able to go to different places and he was a citizen in two different places. So um, he knew that he um, it created more uh, opportunities for him, uh, more uh, education opportunities. Um, and then we see Tarsus quickly grew into a cultural and inter intellectual center, um, which again goes back to him being educated and again, these different opportunities that he was able to have um, that some others weren't able to have, but because of these opportunities, he used those um, to kind of drive him to uh, do what he was doing, first being a Pharisee, but then being a missionary for um, and spreading God's word, and he was able to use the knowledge that he was able to gain from the dual citizenship and the education um, to again be a better, do better at his job, uh, essentially. Um, and then we have, uh, I was trying to make, I was just making some connections and looking at timelines and different things. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. This is something I was thinking about a lot. Um, again, we have Jesus being born in zero AD, um, four or five years, four or five years later after Paul was born. Um, so it seemed, and again, 
Jesus was born in Bethlehem next to Jerusalem, which was pretty far away from Tarsus in, in the first map that I showed you. Um, but the things that Jesus were doing and the things that Paul was doing were were kind of lining up almost. It was seen that they'd be lining up. Um, and around 26 AD, Jesus started his ministry. Um, and this is, it's the same ministry that Paul essentially wanted to stop. He wanted to stop the, the spread of Christianity. Um, and again, we see... Paul becoming a Pharisee, um, he was probably a Pharisee around 26 AD, I would, I would uh, say that's safe to say. Um, Jesus is starting this ministry. He's trying to spread Christianity, and Paul is trying to stop it. And it's, it's this interesting dynamic, and they're happening in two different places, of course, but I, I, would, I would assume to say that word spread pretty quickly about what Jesus was doing, um, and probably even what Paul was doing, because uh, they were both good, very good at what they were doing. Um, and then Jesus' teachings are uh, the teachings Paul eventually would teach. Again, we see the this transformation that Paul has on the road to Damascus, and he embraces this, and he takes it, and he runs full steam ahead with this, and he's like, I'm going to do this. This is going to happen. I want to spread this. Um, and again, Jesus, Jesus is teaching these things. Paul is not there, but he's in the same, living in the same time period that these things are happening. So, I'm just, again, assuming word is spreading quickly. He's hearing these things, and... Um, I don't even know if he would know that, like, if he were to hear Jesus, uh, one of Jesus' teachings, that he would be teaching that one day and sharing that with other churches. Um, so I just thought it was kind of a cool dynamic, a cool uh, way of looking at what was happening at the same time. Um, I have one more that I was thinking of, uh, talking about Paul's life and then talking about also the Roman Empire. Um, like I said, he was a dual citizen in Rome. Tarsus was a capital of one of these Roman provinces. Um, but Rome was the dominant power in the time of Paul, um, when Paul was growing his ministry. And Rome was kind of controlling everything. And I have a map right here, and you can kind of see the Roman Empire um, and where it touched. And it, it touched the top of Africa all the way up to London and then all the way over to Jerusalem. Um, so it covered a lot of land. The the Romans were they had all of this land. It was it was it's kind of crazy, um, looking at this and seeing the power they had. Um, but the, they were the they were the powerhouse. They were the the leaders of everything. Um, and Rome eventually became the primary primary persecutor of the first century. Um, so we again we have Paul here, a uh, Roman citizen, um, starting to go head to head against Rome. Um, and challenging Rome and its laws, and um, again, it's just this crazy thing to think that Paul, this man, um, again, once a Pharisee, is now going at the Roman Empire, um, trying to spread Christianity, um, and then the Romans, we, we find out that are, they are the ones who imprisoned Paul um, for his work multiple times, because Paul was, again, so hell-bent on um, spreading Christianity, which is a great thing. Um, but he was imprisoned by the Romans, and uh, they did not treat him well. Um, they showed him very unfair punishment and unfair trials. And um, I read about uh, Paul and Silas and their experience they had in, in prison, um, minus everything, the earthquake and everything that happens, but just how they were treated and kind of the way Paul describes what the what the cell looked like. It's just very unfair, un, unhumane. Um, and it just kind of shows the character of the Romans, I think, in this time period and, and the Romans that Paul were, were was going up against. Um, moving on, Paul uh, Paul the tent maker. Now, this was super fun to, uh, to um, kind of research because I really had no idea. Um, I did some research. I know that he was a tradesman of some sort. I didn't know exactly what he did. Um, but I read the prompt. I was like, oh, he's a tent maker. That's cool. So started doing some research, found out some really cool things. I think this is really awesome, actually. Um, tent makers were mission-motivated Christians uh, back then. Um, so they would make these tents. Uh, they were able to support themselves because they were doing the secular work that they were able to make a profit from. Um, the church didn't have to pay them to go and be missionaries. They were able to support themselves because they did this work. Um, and they did this work one to make money but it was also a really cool outlet um to do evangelism as well they were able to use the secular job that they were working and evangelize with people 
um, because of it. And it's just cross-cultural because they would they would be moving all over the place, making tents for people, different cultures. They go to different cities and and, and countries and and make these tents for people, um, all at the same time evangelizing. Um, which is awesome. It's just so cool. And it's, so, it's such a cool example for us in the modern day where a lot of us uh, don't work at a church. We, a lot of people work a nine to five and a lot of people work just these really um, almost meaningless jobs. But this like just goes to show that like every job has a meeting and we can all, we can all make an impact at our, in our workplace. Um, just like these tent makers did. They're working this secular job. We all work a lot of secular jobs. Um, but they're still able to evangelize and it just shows you that like nothing should be able to hold you back. You, you should always have Jesus on the forefront of your mind and like spreading his word and sharing his gospel with people. Um, so yeah, again, really cool. A um, little bit more information. Uh, Paul worked to adapt culture, um, but to also win people over. So he would, like I said, it's cross-cultural. So he would go to these different places, meet these different cultures, learn about these different cultures. Um, but Paul being the kind of person he was, um, he was able to win people over and he was able to kind of almost build a team. And we kind of talked about this in one of our discussion questions that Paul worked with a lot of people. He was able to build this team of people to help him evangelize. Um, another interesting fact that I found that he worked with the lower class because that's where the majority of the people were. Now, looking at this from a business standpoint, this is genius, like appealing to the lower class um, appealing to the population that has the most people and then, then speaking in terms of evangelizing, like this is even better because like that's more people who get to know who Jesus is. Um, so Paul was really almost like ahead of his game, I think. I mean, I'm sure there were different people doing this, uh, but we know about Paul and we hear about Paul and he is truly amazing. Um, but he was really ahead of his game when it came to this, uh, evangelizing stuff and working this secular job. Um, and it was, it was really interesting to kind of read and hear about how he did this. He created a culture that made uh, full-time unpaid evangelists. Now, full-time unpaid evangelists, like, you hear that and you're like, wow, there aren't a lot of those around. Um, because financially, one, it doesn't make sense because you're not being paid to do what you do. Um, and then you're also doing it full time. So there's not, there's not a lot of time for other things that, for you to do, but um, he was able to show this example of that you were able to do this full time, whether you're at your secular job or in your free time, um, that you were able to evangelize full time um, and not have to be paid for it because you can work a trade. Um, like a lot of these lower class people did, they were tradesmen, they, they uh, carpenters, tent makers, um, just different like craftsmen, woodworkers, um, they were able to do this and still evangelize. So he was teaching, he wasn't, he was not only teaching the teachings of Jesus, but he was teaching people how to share Jesus in their everyday life. And I think that's super cool. Um, and I think it's still super relevant today. And again, it's just Paul, we see, I always find, seem to find, something that I can apply to my everyday life whenever I learn about Paul. Um, and I'm just like, it's a, and a testament to who he was um, and what he did. Um, these are my references. Uh, I use the textbook a lot. Um, I've really come to love BibleStudy.org and Blue Letter Bible. Um, those are probably my two favorite websites as far as finding questions um, that I have. And then um, I did get some information from a lot of these. Um, I got a lot of pictures from them as well. Um, but yeah, those are my references. This is my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time and listening. Um, and then I'm also uh, very excited to keep moving forward and learning more about Paul um, just as a person and who he was. Um, this this uh, assignment definitely brought, or, um, broadened my horizon as to who he was. Um, and there's so much more to learn about him. But yeah, this is my presentation. Thank you again. Have a good one.